How's it going, everyone? Today we will be starting a discussion on how cardiac output is controlled. Remember that cardiac output is how we measure performance of our heart. And so we're gonna be talking about all the different things that impact cardiac output. We're gonna start to combine concepts together. And so we're gonna describe the relationship about how the heart is gonna impact the vasculature and how the vasculature is going to impact the heart. So let's start off first with talking about the determinants of cardiac output. And in this figure here to the left, you can see those four primary determinants. They are going to be heart rate and myocardial contractility, which are known as the cardiac factors. And then we have the coupling factors, which are preload and afterload. The cardiac factors are relatively straightforward. And remember, the formula for cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. So heart rate obviously is going to influence the perf performance of the heart and how much blood is ejected per minute. Um, and then we've discussed myocardial contractility when the force of contraction goes up. Uh, pressures go up with inside the ventricle during uh, systole, and then that is going to increase stroke volume, therefore increasing cardiac output. And so today we're going to talk a little bit more about preload and afterload. We've discussed them in the past, and we know that increasing preload can uh, help to increase stroke volume and therefore cardiac output but increasing afterload has an inverse relationship, which will decrease stroke volume and cardiac output. So heart rate, uh, obviously, you know, impacts cardiac output, and then myocardial contractility, afterload, and preload are all going to affect stroke volume, which impacts cardiac output. The reason why we call preload and afterload coupling factors is because they represent the functional coupling between the heart and the peripheral vasculature. So we know that preload and afterload are determinants of cardiac output, which means that if you change preload and afterload, ultimately it's going to have an impact and change cardiac output. But the reason why they are called coupling factors is because cardiac output also impacts them. So if we have changes in cardiac output, ultimately we are going to have changes in preload and afterload. So basically, we're describing the relationship between an independent variable and a dependent variable. And so when we say the determinants of cardiac output, we are saying that preload and afterload are the independent variables, while cardiac output is the dependent variable. Changes in these two will ultimately impact cardiac output. Uh, but also, again, the relationship works in the other direction. So when we say that preload and afterload are determined by cardiac output, that means that this is the independent variable, cardiac output. And when it goes up or down, it ultimately will impact preload and afterload in this scenario being the dependent variables. And so these two relationships are expressed in two different graphs. Uh, the cardiac function curve, aka the Frank Starling relationship, and that describes uh, when preload is the determinant of cardiac output. And then the vascular function curve, uh, which shows the effects of cardiac output ultimately on preload. And so we'll talk a little bit more about these graphs in future lectures. But today, again, we're just going to break down the relationship uh, between preload, afterload, and cardiac output. We know through preload previous lectures that preload and afterload are determinants of cardiac output. Preload is a determinant of cardiac output because when there is an increase in preload, an increase in venous return, therefore we know that there is an increase in sarcomere length of cardiac muscles, and then this helps to increase stroke volume and therefore cardiac output. Again, we've discussed this before, and this is known as the Frank Starling relationship. It also works in the opposite mechanism in which if there's a decrease in preload, then there is a decrease in stroke volume and cardiac output as well. Afterload, we know, has an inverse relationship. If aortic pressure, therefore afterload increases, that is going to decrease stroke volume and cardiac output. However, if arterial pressure and aortic pressure decrease, uh, that's going to allow for cardiac output to 
increase. So when we think about this on a graph, preload and afterload are the independent variables in this case, and changes in these two variables will ultimately um, you know, bring about changes in cardiac output, and cardiac output, therefore, would be the dependent variable. So on the graph, if we were um, you know, laying this out, preload and afterload, our independent variable on the x-axis, and then the dependent variable of cardiac output on the y-axis. The reason, however, why preload and afterload are coupling factors is because they are also determined by cardiac output. And so in this case, we are flipping the independent and dependent variables. Now cardiac output becomes independent, and it is going to have an impact on both preload and afterload. Afterload. And so when you increase cardiac output, I want you to think about what really that means. That means that more blood is being ejected from the heart and then entering the arterial circulation and then the total circulation overall, right? So more blood is leaving the heart and entering the peripheral circulation. So peripheral blood volume is increasing. So now when we talk about the effects of cardiac output on afterload, well, if we eject out more blood from the heart, well, then the arterial blood volume is going to increase. And if arterial blood volume increases, then arterial blood pressure and then aortic blood pressure also increases. And that's afterload. So by increasing cardiac output, we actually increase afterload on the subsequent beats. And also decreasing cardiac output would therefore decrease afterload. We're gonna talk more about the relationship between cardiac output and preload in uh, future lectures, but to try to briefly explain it, again, by increasing cardiac output, we're increasing the amount of blood that's entering the peripheral circulation. And as we'll discuss, a lot of these areas of the body are going to be compliant and they're gonna hold on to that extra blood. And if these areas of the body and these vessels are holding on to more blood, well then ultimately that is less making its way back to the right atrium. And when we have less venous return, we know that preload decreases. So by increasing cardiac output and ejecting more blood into the, v, uh, the uh, circulation, less it's going to make its way back if there are not changes that occur. And we're gonna talk about those changes. But anyway, an increase in cardiac output therefore would decrease preload. And then the opposite holds true where a decrease in cardiac output means that less has entered the circulation, more is then held within the heart and then EDV and diastolic volume on the subsequent beats would uh, remain relatively high. And since there is more uh, you know, blood volume that's remaining in the left ventricle, that is going to increase preload. So an increase in cardiac output decreases preload and a decrease in cardiac output increases preload. So what I said on the last few slides is summarized here when we are saying that preload and afterload are determinants of cardiac output. Preload and afterload are our independent variables and cardiac output is our dependent variable. Increases in preload lead to increases in cardiac output. Decreases in preload lead to decreases in cardiac output. Increases in afterload lead to decreases in cardiac output, and then decreases in afterload lead to increases in cardiac output. When we say that preload and afterload are determined by cardiac output, that means cardiac output is now our independent variable, and preload and afterload are ultimately determined by cardiac output as dependent variables. And so by increasing cardiac output, again, we are pumping more out into the circulation unless it's making its way back. So that decreases preload. And then the opposite, when the heart's output decreases, more remains in the ventricles and that preload, that stretch before systole remains a little bit higher. So again, the heart is having adjustments and the cardiovascular system is having adjustments second to second. So changes on one beat will ultimately impact the next 
beat, right? And so, you know, we're going to talk all about this relationship more. Um, and ultimately, you know, the body's not going to allow, um, you know, cardiac output to remain decreased. So, you know, we're going to talk about this relationship, what happens when cardiac output increases, how do then we prevent preload from decreasing. So for now, I'm just talking about the direct impact. Uh, in future lectures, we'll talk a little bit more about how the body then adjusts to this impact. And to wrap up here, again, an increase in cardiac output increases the amount of blood in the arterial circulation, thereby increasing afterload on the following beats. The opposite is also true. Decrease in cardiac output decreases the amount of blood in the arterial circulation, therefore decreasing afterload on the following beats. Well, that concludes part one. As the lectures go on, we're going to talk a little bit more about all the different things that are going to impact the performance of the heart and cardiac output. And we're going to talk more about this relationship between the cardiovascular, uh, sorry, the cardiac uh, performance and the vasculature, and ultimately how our body adjusts to all these different changes in order to optimize uh, cardiovascular performance and keep up with blood flow around the body. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you in the next video.